All right, thank you for joining our Phoenix LiDAR Systems webinar today. Uh, here to present our uh, topic is Ira Monkfold. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Phoenix LiDAR Systems webinar for this month. My name is Ira Monkfold. I'm on the post-processing team here at Phoenix. Uh, and uh, through that lens, I get to see all sorts of different data sets, different problems, different clients. Uh, and today, we will be going through a walkthrough, the front to back understanding of power line utility surveys through the lens of LiDAR. Um, we'll be describing this um, through a fictional case study. So um, please keep in mind that company names are certainly fictitious, as you will see, uh, but it should give us a good uh, foundation in which to describe the front to back process uh, of Powerline Utility Surveys. Here at Phoenix LiDAR Systems, uh, we specialize in compact and customizable mapping systems, uh, primarily LiDAR based, but we also integrate all sorts of other remote sensing sensors uh, onto a variety of platforms. Um, every project, every client, every hardware has a different strength, a different weakness, a different um, set of parameters that are needed. And so having multiple platforms and multiple remote sensing ser uh, sensors allows us to answer any of these challenging questions. So why Phoenix LiDAR? Well, we've, uh, we've been pioneers in a lot of this, uh, this industry. The first commercial UAV LiDAR system, uh, our 3D visualization software, uh, vertical takeoff and landing UAV systems, uh, amongst many other firsts, uh, have allowed us to uh, be presented with a challenge and present our clients with an answer, a very actionable answer uh, in your surveying challenge. So uh, the challenge we will bring to you today is going to be uh, utility power light surveys uh, through the lens of LiDAR and UAVs. So in this case study, we will be approaching every aspect of the power line assessment, um, starting from in the office with uh, phone calls and emails, responding to RFPs, uh, to actually planning and acquiring the data, processing and delivering actionable data. It's important to think about all of these factors at this point uh, before even responding to an RFP or um, sending anybody out in the field or getting the computers spinning up with post-processing. Uh, the front to back understanding of these power line assessments is critical um, in order to make efficient steps forward to ensure that your acquisition properly supports the planned post-processing and that most importantly your deliverables are actionable, efficient, and effective for your client. The beauty of LiDAR is that we're able to accomplish nearly all of these things with a very efficient, effective sensor. Um, LiDAR is being, being utilized very heavily in the utility industry, uh, power lines for assessing these, these structures, these lines, these circuits, uh, due to its high accuracy, um, the ability to penetrate vegetation and to very much, uh, to provide a much better understanding of vegetation compared to say photogrammetry based methods, uh, being able to see the 3D structure of a tree as well as the ground underneath it is imperative for these type of surveys uh, in that vegetation and what might be hidden underneath or within it uh, could provide the uh, largest danger point for a particular circuit. Another very important part uh, or strength that LiDAR brings us is the ability to detect wires. Once again, compared to photogrammetry where photo mesh uh, quote unquote point clouds often miss these uh, small features. Uh, it's these small features that are very, very important. 
similar to that is the high level of detail involved in uh, LIDAR surveys. This level of detail allows us to present uh, our clients with data that is on the engineering grade level of, uh, of accuracy and detail. Right? We'll be able to pick up hidden hazards, uh, perhaps small distribution lines, um, very nuanced features that otherwise would be lost in a photogrammetry analysis um, or a traditional um, walking, the, walking the lines with stick and G GPS antenna. Uh, and with that said, um, instead of sending your crew out to the field to hands-on survey these uh, circuits, LiDAR and UAV-based LiDAR provides a high level of safety, uh, which is imperative to these industries and uh, something that really is paramount before, before anything else. Uh, if you can't get this survey done safely, then, um, then a new way needs to be thought of. So to hit all of these points, LiDAR really uh, knocks it all out of the park. With that said, I'd like to introduce you to our uh, fictitious case study. Um, Stewart's Utility Company has rebuilt a rural section of their uh, relatively small kilovolt circuit. Uh, this is a 115 kilovolt circuit in their network. Um, Contrary to the image on the right, which depict very, very large towers, these 115 kilovolt towers are slightly smaller, uh, still in the um, category of transmission lines. So we are not in the tiny wires such as distribution or phone lines, uh, but certainly not the gigantic towers coming from, uh, say, Hoover Dam or something like that. Uh, they needed to analyze this freshly built uh, section of their circuit uh, to update their utility models. This is a very common place um, in the utility industry when uh, towers need to be replaced or perhaps um, the understanding of the SAG has uh, become a problem and so these towers need to uh, come closer together or perhaps be raised. So they have rebuilt this section of the circuit and uh, we need to go out and and survey it to make sure it fits into the, your utility models. Um, the RFP that they released uh, outlined a scope of work. Um, the plan, acquisition, processing, and delivery of the products uh, to update their models. So we are providing them essentially a, uh, a data delivery that is going to be input into their PLS CAD modeling uh, for their federal compliance and safety regulations. So with all of those words said, and all of the RFP language kind of thrown out there, what does this actually mean in terms of your planning and how you're going to attack this RFP, uh, as well as the actual acquisition and processing of this project? So how does this boil down to sensor specifications, project deliverables, the AOI of the RFP, and really how the timeline uh, has an effect on all of these different processes. So as we uh, saw in our overview um, and purpose, which is very, very important to understand at this step, uh, what is the overarching purpose of this RFP? Uh, what data does this client need and how can we get it to them most effectively and efficiently? So, um, our overview was to collect LiDAR and imagery to patch in uh, point cloud into their existing model. Uh, some of the more, uh, some of the details involved in the scope of work included a 100 meter right of way, um, one base station needed due to the length of the circuit, which is a very important uh, aspect to think about in terms of planning. If your right of way is, um, going on the order of 10 to 20 to 30 kilometers long, you're gonna start thinking about additional base station locations, additional uh, takeoff and landing locations. And so the uh, scope of work can balloon very quickly as the size of the right of way also uh, extends. 
uh, full tower and attachment point capture uh, was required. It was a fairly subtle, nuanced verbiage in the RFP, but this simply means that um, in terms of acquisition, we can't get away with doing a single pass over this uh, circuit. Um, there's an important part of acquisition that, uh, that goes into these right-of-way surveys in that laser shadowing and parallel image parallax can become an issue. Um, imagine if you flew just on one side of the tower uh, with your laser sensor and did just one pass on the right side of the tower, then the, let's say you're on the right side of the towers, then the left side of the towers would be shadowed from, from the structure itself. Uh, this also plays into the buildings or vegetation in the area. Uh, so based on this wording in the RFP, we've determined that we need two different passes on this uh, circuit in order to capture the left and right side and have full capture of their towers and attachment points. With this said, um, point density is also uh, often a requisition of this. Um, our 20 points per square meter required density is fairly typical uh, and very easily achievable with our Phoenix LiDAR systems. Now acquisition is very important to understand at this point in time, but also data delivery as well. If your acquisition doesn't support the data that you're trying to deliver, um, say the point density for the uh, resolution of your digital elevation model or contours, then uh, then we have a problem. We might acquire data that we won't be able to actually action upon. So important to understand that our data delivery specifications, our point cloud, uh, vectorization of our conductor wires, uh, digital elevation model, as well as contours at half meter resolution, and um, obviously a project report. This project report is often very important for our clients, um, especially how, as they are reporting to perhaps federal institutions or a larger utility company and need to have uh, the proof of how things were acquired and planned as well as uh, some of the spe sensor specifics. So this is another, um, I guess you could say another view of the same scope of work, the same RFP. Uh, this way, before we had described things with bullet points and actions and how we're acquiring, what we're delivering, um, but often in response to an RFP, a more, um, for lack of a better word, wordy description is important to respond to. Uh, as we are bridging between the RFP and the client's needs and the post-processing team and data delivery and how we communicate between the two. There are many people in between that um, understand hardware specifics and technical um, jargon, but there are also a lot of people that uh, really appreciate the overview, the words, the uh, qualitative understanding. And so, it's very important to write that out in that way as well, just to make sure you're covering all of your bases. So upon analysis of this case study uh, with the right-of-way length and width uh, of the project area, we've determined that our hardware uh, that we are going to deploy is our Phoenix LiDAR system Scout 32, um, coupled with an A6000 image uh, camera. And we're going to deploy it on a UAV platform. Um, this is due to the size of our project. This is a relatively small patch into their larger circuit model. Uh, I believe this is only a few kilometers long. So uh, one flight with two passes was sufficient. Um, this is another important thing to note when you are planning this, uh, these types of projects is, is this feasible with a UAV? Um, when you're getting into the tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers, um, it is often very much worthwhile for your both the time and effort in the field, uh, as well as the time and effort uh, in the office post-processing to, um, to look into a helicopter rental. Um, having a helicopter pilot your system um, 
can knock out many, many, many more kilometers uh, with a single flight than the UAV, and also requir requires much less takeoff and landing. Um, and so you can often hammer out a couple tens of kilometers in a single flight. One other aspect that uh, is often commonplace in these power line uh, surveys is the need of a weather station. Um, input into these models, utility models, often requires loading of the, uh, what's called wire loading. Um, essentially, the particular sag of a wire is based on its, uh, the weather conditions that it's surrounded by, as well as the conditions within the wire, how much electricity is being pumped through. And so very often weather conditions are needed in order to properly model these wires. In this particular, um, this particular case, that was, not the, that was not the case. So this is the... Uh, breakdown of the scope of work in terms of our physical area, as well as our data uh, needed. Our physical area of our AOI uh, really dictated our, phys our uh, system choice. Our 100 meter right of way was easily accomplished with two passes in our Scout 32 system. Um, and also knowing what sort of towers and wires uh, we're trying to collect is very important. So uh, a quick look, at, look in Google Earth in your KML um, shows you what type of tower you're looking at and making sure that your acquisition as you have planned will uh, capture the features of interest, being the conductors, attachment points, and the full capture of the tower itself. The, K, the kilovolt of the tower is a fairly important um, feature to note, uh, both warrants the height of your flight. Uh, some of these larger kilovolt towers can be quite tall, uh, a couple hundred feet at some times. So that can very much change uh, how you view your point density based on the height that you'll have to fly in order to capture these features, uh, as well as um, the general, um, as much area as you could capture in a single flight. If you're flying higher, you'll generally capture more data, uh, but usually at a lower density. Uh, similar to the, this, these parameters are uh, even tight, con tighter constraints are our imagery. Our image footprint is often much smaller than our LiDAR footprint. And so making sure that we flight plan uh, in order to make sure that our imagery is sufficient to colorize both sides of the towers all the way up the tower uh, and the other features in the right way is very important. And of course, all of this goes into our acquisition planning, uh, which is meant to make sure that our models, our DEMs, our contours, our catenary vectors are able to be produced from the data collected. So let's get into the actual acquisition planning and bridge the, uh, the the gap between the client's needs and the deliverables that they will end up in at the end, at the end of the project. So as I mentioned before, it's uh, very important to note the difference between right-of-way and wide area mission planning. Uh, wide area mission planning, if you have been involved in any of your previous webinars, uh, is often seen as the lawnmower approach of acquiring data. Uh, you have long straight flight lines that uh, fly parallel to each other and ideally also have a crossing line between them to tie all the, the flight lines together. Right away is a little bit different. Uh, you have a much narrower, much longer uh, area of interest, which is usually just captured with one or two passes. Uh, this is uh, once again, important to note the laser shadowing and imagery parallax, because if you're not uh, doing your lawnmower mission where you're 
going back over the same, more or less the same area multiple times. It's uh, important to make sure that your data will be captured the way you plan. Uh, also, because our base station corrections to our GN GNSS antenna on our rover is, um, is based on the distance from our base station, uh, the base station as well as the takeoff and landing locations are very important to uh, plan ahead of time to maximize our accuracy from our hardware. And uh, this goes with wide area as well as right, right of way but often more important with right-of-way is to plan to overcapture your AOI. Um, it is, especially with laser shadowing and parallax, the edges of your right-of-way can often have uh, slightly less resolute or less dense data if you do not plan to overcapture uh, and can result in some degradation of da data quality. And one very important Thing to note is the curved flight lines during right-of-way acquisitions. Uh, in a wide area, we luckily have the ability to fly in any direction uh, and make our parallel lawnmower type acquisition. In right-of-way, we're obviously constrained to more or less a uh, straight and narrow, or sometimes not straight and narrow, uh, area of interest. And as we have taught in the past, uh, and what is commonplace in our industry is that straight flight lines produce better data than flight lines that tend to curve. Uh, with that, as you can see in these two screenshots, we do have a little bit of a curve. And while there isn't a cold, hard rule of thumb, uh, we tend to, here at Phoenix LiDAR, to say that any turn over five degrees of heading, um, which is conducted in one second or less should warrant a new flight line. And the way that we would plan to do that, let's say that this turn in our uh, right of way here was more than five degrees. Uh, we would end up planning to fly a straight line, pull away from our right of way, uh, do a clover leaf turn formation and uh, so that we can fly back onto our new direction of flight uh, with a straight flight line to an order in order to be able to only use our straight flight lines for data processing. Uh, while this, once again, this isn't a cold, hard rule of thumb, it's something to be very cognizant of while planning your acquisition. Another very important part about acquisition planning is the actual sensor specifications, uh, most specifically to your LiDAR. Um, Every type of LiDAR has um, a different uh, verbiage for this, whether you're in a Regal sensor or a Velodyne sensor, as I've described here. But our lines per second, or the spin velocity of our sensor, is important to, uh, to balance with your, with your AGL, your above ground line, and your speed in order to uh, match your along point and side point distances. You can see in the little diagram with green dots that the point array is fairly well spread. Uh, if our lines per second or spin velo velocity was far too fast, we would find uh, our data being very smooshed top to bottom. If it was very slow, you'd find it very uh, spread out top to bottom, but our side to side density would be much tighter. And so to avoid tiger striping or inconsistencies in our point cloud, we need to adjust all of these factors um, to ensure a, um, a consistent point cloud throughout the entire right of way. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of variables involved in this uh, between altitude, speed, point density, uh, laser spin velocity. Uh, but all of these things are able to be programmed into our open flight planner at phoenixlidar.com. Uh, very important to make sure that all of these parameters are balanced at the same time. And this program uh, works very well to do so while also planning out your flight plan itself. Um, a special note for power line collection is the idea of angular step versus beam divergence. Uh, 
Beam divergence is essentially the spread of the laser uh, over a certain distance. And the angular step is uh, how quickly the laser is being fired or how quickly it's being spun. So essentially the angle between every laser pulse. Now, if these two things are not balanced correctly, uh, you may have gaps in your laser divergence that a power line could slip through. Um, so ensuring that um, your beam divergence and your angular step are also um, balanced with your lines per second or spin velocity, altitude and speed to ensure that the small features in your point cloud are being captured, whether it's power lines, insulators, or small trees or features close to the ground. These are all very important features to be collected in these surveys. Now ground controls is also very important in these surveys as we are often dealing with engineering grade data. We need engine, engineering grade accuracies. And so uh, planning your ground control array prior to acquisition is also very important to ensure that you have the proper data to not only um, make sure that your data matches the ground control, but also have enough ground control to assess the absolute accuracies after the project is completed. Um, based on your RFP and your scope of work, you will determine whether you need a professional land surveys stamp on these ground control points. Usually not necessary, but that is not a scenario you want to find out about ahead of time or after the fact. Um, with that said, these ground control points should be collected on hard surfaces in the AOI, not on vegetation. Um, these hard surfaces create discrete points for the LIDAR to capture uh, without the ambiguity of vegetation. They should also be collected away from the power line itself. Um, the power lines can often provide uh, the GNSS antenna some interference um, and subsequent inaccuracies. Um, while you may not have hard surfaces throughout your entire project, uh, I know you'll do your best. But uh, another important thing to note is to spread these ground control points uh, throughout your AOI uh, as appropriately as possible. As you can see on the image on the right, a highway survey, these points were spread out every kilometer or two and created a very nice uh, array in which to assess our accuracy. And if possible, um, utilizing photo identifiable locations, such as uh, painted chevrons or manhole covers, uh, is very helpful um, for the imagery collection and also to make sure that uh, our horizontal accuracies of ground control are as best as possible. So now that we've gone out and collected our data, uh, with our very specific parameters and understanding of the project area. Now we get to get into the fun stuff of post-processing. Uh, and we have spoken a little bit about this in previous webinars, but once again, I'm going to be focusing on the idea of uh, power lines and how our utility focused post-processing can provide data deliverables uh, for our client. Now here's a general post-processing overview for our power line uh, workflows. Uh, obviously, we acquire our data. Um, the data that we would acquire not only is our remote sensing data, such as LiDAR and imagery, but also navigation data, uh, the GNSS uh, GPS information, as well as the IMU information on the platform itself provides us the trajectory. And we also are collecting the ground control array. Uh, which will go into our calibration and uh, accuracy assessments. Obviously, our imagery and LIDAR and trajectory will all be pulled together into a raw point cloud. Um, this point cloud is then calibrated and compared with the ground control to uh, give us a final RGB extracted point cloud. Once this RGB extracted point cloud is created and is geospatially accurate, uh, we then have um, the foundation in which to provide all sorts of deliverables. Um, these deliverables can range um, from what we have seen in our scope of work today to all sorts of other um, actionable data products for other industries. 
Uh, but the important thing is to have a foundation of the RGB extracted, calibrated, uh, geospatially accurate point cloud. So, as I mentioned in that flowchart, trajectory post-processing is uh, really our first major step. Uh, we need to combine the GNSS observations with the IMU observations from the rover, uh, tie in the corrections from our base station, which is hopefully set up very nearby, uh, in order to get a very clear understanding of the XYZ location, as well as the orientation of the LiDAR sensor at any given time in our survey. Once this trajectory has been processed and that information is understood, we then marry the raw scanner information, the range information from our LiDAR, uh, to this uh, trajectory in order to produce our initial point cloud. Uh, ground control points, as we saw in our flowchart before, as well as imagery are also brought into this process, uh, thus creating our calibrated uh, or an initial colorized point cloud. Here on the right, we uh, can see a report from our LiDAR mill, our cloud-based post-processing system. This is during our nav lab post-processing of the trajectory, uh, which can be done um, after the scan. If you upload your data into LiDAR mill, uh, by the time you wake up the next morning, you'll have your trajectory ready to go, if not your point cloud as well. Um, and up above is our loose representation of our calibration process here. So after all of this initial processing, uh, and this processing can be conducted in uh, a variety of softwares, uh, our LiDAR mill Cloud-based software is what I would recommend, but we also have the ability to have more hands-on approaches, such as our Spatial Explorer 5 um, processing suite, as well as um, other third-party softwares, such as Inertial Explorer or TerraSolid. Um, but at this point, we are left with an unclassified colorized point cloud, uh, and really the blank slate in order to provide us uh, with data products to uh, give to our client. The first step we really need to do to get um, actionable data out of this point cloud is to classify this point cloud. Um, we are going to use automated processes as much as we can. Um, we all have lives to live and and manually classifying every point in every single point cloud is a great way to avoid that. So we like to use as many automated processes as possible. With this said, uh, a manual classification is always needed after this to uh, fix errors or, um, or parts that our automated process has missed. So there are many different ways of uh, classifying your data, many different ways, many different softwares, um, both, both from LiDAR Mill to Spatial Explorer to TerraSolid, um, as well as many other programs. There are a variety of ways of accomplishing this. So I will speak of it in a, in a general sense um, to allow any user, any, uh, anybody listening to this right now to uh, I encourage you to use the software that you have in-house or the software that you have accessible to you um, and find a way to make these, these deliverables uh, as easily as possible. Two routines that are commonplace in these softwares are a height from ground and a classify by center line. These two steps are very helpful in uh, power line classification. Um, height from ground allows you to exclude any, uh, any features close to the ground, um, which generally are not power lines or towers. Uh, and the center line is often an easy uh, data product to either create or is handed to you from your client, uh, which shows the center line of your circuit. Uh, this can be a great data product in order to build your classification from. 
Uh, and using these little higher level automated routines uh, enables an easier manual classification um, and an easier manual cleanup. So as I mentioned before, once our data is classified, uh, it's much easier to make these data products and pull analytics from them uh, and provide your client with a um, with the deliverables that they don't have to sift through the whole point cloud to find um, answers given to their questions uh, right there out of the data. So with the data, let's go into MicroStation and TerraSolid and take a peek at this circuit we have. This is the uh, circuit of interest that we have collected for our uh, Stewart's utility company. Um, here we are seeing the point cloud in color, uh, but since we're talking about classification so much, let's go to our classes here. And so this has been classified uh, per the request and per the feature codes of our client. You can see this vectorized center line here is the center line I spoke of before uh, that enabled us to classify on either side of it after a height from ground in order to isolate this uh, main circuit. Once that main circuit has been classified, a manual process of looking at each span in cross section allowed us to clean up the data and make sure that all of our classifications were consistent and accurate. If we use our display mode once again, I'm going to turn off our ground points so that it's easier to see our circuit. We can turn off individual classes to show the classification that has been conducted. Um, our other wire class is the non-essential uh, wires of our circuit. You can see that those disappear. Uh, also important to note that even on our main circuit are two wires that are not conductors. These are called shield wires that protect the main wires from uh, lightning bolts. So we can turn those off. Uh, now we can see that our other towers can be turned off. And then we are left with solely our towers and wires turn off our towers, we can see that we are left with just the spans of our data. So this is the ideal way, uh, ideal ending point for your classification. Most of this was done with automated processes, uh, but did require a little bit of uh, manual interpretation and, and cleanup. So once this data was classified and cleaned up, um, producing vectorization of the wires of the conductor wires was quite easy. Um, a vectorized wires toolbox is in the program I just showed. Um, and this fairly detailed um, and fairly specific data deliverable is uh, easily created out of that toolbox. You can see that the point cloud up above, classified as we saw it before, and then with all of our points uh, removed from the scene, you can see our wire vectors left over. Uh, these vectors are helpful for uh, clearance analysis and input into other CAD-based programs and can help um, with the determination of hazards in your, in your circuits right away. So all of this work uh, really is to get us to this point of our data products and delivery. We wanted to bring the client's problem statement and their overview and boil it down into data products uh, that are delivered to them and can be instantly actioned upon uh, by their team. So circling back to our RFP, 
we have we have created um, a series of data products um, from our classification, especially. So the surface products that we saw, the contours and digital elevation model, were all created from our ground classification that we applied um, during the calibration process of our point cloud processing. Um, obviously, we were also left with a colorized calibrated classified point cloud. Um, so you can see it's in the center bottom. Um, and always and always, we uh, provide a detailed project report for the engineers and the end users. While we only had three or four essential data products being delivered from this project, that doesn't mean that there aren't a series of other things that can be pulled or pulled from your uh, from your acquisition. Um, planometrics are very often a expected deliverable. Uh, you can see on the top right here, a series of planometrics, vegetation in green, roads in red, uh, water in blue. Um, these usually two-dimensional uh, vectorization of features uh, are often used for hazard detection. Um, roads, railways, and waters can provide um, interesting uh, differences in the hazard mitigation for your circuits. Uh, if you imagine a very large train going underneath the power line, they probably want to know uh, where that train would be going through and how much the power line would sag in that location. Uh, another possible data product is a digital terrain model seen on the bottom right. This is the highest hit model of our project area. It, uh, it shows a very nice visualization of the uh, three-dimensionality of the, of the uh, project area, especially when viewed in combination with the digital elevation model. Um, <clears throat> tree segmentation or um, a vectorization of your vegetation is very helpful in order to make sure that our uh, hazard mitigation is properly understood and can be actioned upon by our, by our client. Um, while it was a necessity for our client to be able to see the attachment points of our towers, we weren't asked to give any data products from them. But this is very easily done by ad identifying these attachment points where the wires hit the insulators of the tower uh, and can uh, help the modeling process. And if your data was required to be uh, Collected with a weather station, obviously weather station information and applying that weathering information to our power lines themselves uh, would be another possible data product. And the most important and often the largest reason for these surveys is uh, vegetation encroachment uh, from either fall in danger um, as you can probably see on the bottom left, uh, the, the idea of a tree maybe getting hit by lightning or becoming diseased and able to fall into our power lines is a very, um, very bad situation, one that causes, that can cause uh, forest fires or other types of disasters. Uh, so those are hugely important to be mitigated, as well as grow in danger, as you can see on the top uh, image. Uh, after a certain point in time, those trees are going to get tall enough to influence those power lines. So um, analyzing the data in your right of way for these vegetation dangers is essential. And uh, a, large, um, a large need from our clients in this industry. Uh, very often, this uh, vegetation danger is being analyzed in software such as PLS CAD. Uh, to identify these potential hazards, uh, but it's very important that we do our due diligence prior to input into PLS CAD to ensure that our data is uh, accurate enough to make these decisions on, uh, dense enough to understand all of our features, uh, and um, classified in a way that these features are easily distinguished from one another. With this said, um, 
Stewart's utility company uh, was uh, very happy with all these data products. Uh, we're able to input our classified point cloud into their uh, utility model and uh, match it up to the other ends of the circuit itself. Um, so with this final data product, we were uh, able to have them run with actionable data, mitigate their circuit, um, and stay within federal compliance. With that said, uh, I hope that this uh, webinar and this walkthrough from RFP to planning to acquisition to post-processing and final data delivery uh, really sets you up to be able to knock it out of the park with your potential utility client. Um, and I'd like to thank you for joining us on our webinar and also like to open up uh, for potential Q and A. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ara. Um, can you, uh, so we've got quite a few questions here and, and some, some good ones. You know, the, the, a lot of these, of course, will be the typical, uh, it all depends on uh, answer, but um, the, there, there's the general rule of thumb for GCPs. That's one question of uh, what is uh, our recommended GCP rule of thumb for corridor mapping? Um, I often uh, relate this question to wide area mapping as well. Um, there is, I would say, a minimum of ground control points. Um, we are going to be analyzing our data with these ground control points and also with withholding some of them in order to uh, assess the absolute accuracy. So if we have fewer than 10 ground control points in any given project, even if it's a small one, that's not a statistically sound enough uh, number of points to do these um, analysis on or to provide a, um, an accuracy assessment that you can actually stand uh, on hard ground with. So I'd like to see at least 15 to 20 ground control points for any project, but obviously this is going to uh, balloon quite quickly as your project gets longer or larger. Um, let's say a loose thought of 20 points for every, uh, as a minimum, and then another five points for every five kilometers of right of way. Right on. And I've got another one here as far as accounting for conductor difference. So we've got the overlap mm -hmm. question. So, mm -hmm. and overlap's not ground overlap. You have to account for the tower height as mm -hmm. far as your, your overlap uh, calculation. But uh, from Ruben, the, the, the question is as far as, uh, uh, you know, typically when you're flying these, these uh, large transmission jobs, you have a weather station set up somewhere. And his question um, is, uh, how would you account for the difference in, in XYZ position of, of the conductor, um, you know, considering weather conditions um, uh, as part of these multiple passes? And uh, so I definitely don't have enough power line experience to, to know if you had a four hour flight with a, a manned helicopter um, to, uh, to know how drastic those those changes would be, I, I imagine that you will see uh, mm -hmm. expansion, contraction, X, Y, Z change. Absolutely. Um, um, I don't have a an exact hour in uh, hours in flight or uh, distance from weather station type of metric in mind, but um, just as you just as your question alludes to, the understanding that your weather, your temperature, your wind uh, is going to change throughout time as well as throughout your uh, AOI. Ideally, uh, in an ideal world, we'd set up a weather station for every dead end to dead end structure in our circuit. Um, the weatherization of these lines is done from dead end structure to dead end structure. Um, so ideally, that would be the case. In practicality, that's uh, nearly impossible. So really, um, in my mind, talking with your utility client, talking that through, also having an understanding of the resources that you have at your discretion. Do you have more than one weather station? Do you have um, colleagues or other companies you can ask for? Uh, and so a lot of these limitations will provide themselves to you. 
and uh, providing those to your to your client upon the question and answer section of the RFP response uh, would be very would be the direction I would go with that. Cool. Um, Lito, you're on the, the call too. There's some other questions that um, I came in later to this, but um, uh, there's there's a question about how important the importance of multiple echoes um, with uh, power line mapping. Um, um, the the importance of echoes in power line mapping is, I would say, less than um, other vegetation or land survey type of acquisitions. Mm -hmm. um, almost always your power line is going to be your first return. Uh, and if you somehow get a second return from that tiny little wire down to the ground or vegetation near it, then, then great. But uh, generally the number of echoes or the uh, uh, doesn't have a huge consideration on the quality of data, at least for a power line collection. Okay. Um, this is low temperatures. Uh, just going through some of these. These, if uh, if you haven't answered them yet. Um, so for those that are asking about the presentation, sure, uh, we will uh, make this uh, available after. Provide you all with a a link. Um, and uh, um, so for making a power, so one says, uh, okay, yeah, it's Raul's mentioning that they, they make uh, um, uh, four kilometer uh, power line trajectories uh, using a, a, supply, a spline trajectory and, and they have issues matching, matching them up. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm not sure if even TerraMatch would, does TerraMatch account for those, those thermal differences uh, using the weather stations or is this a PLS CAD type? No, that you bring in the weather station information into PLS CAD and okay. TerraSolid does not uh, deal with line loading information. Okay. Um, Lito, do you have other questions that may need more explanation? Uh, Lito. Sorry about that. My mic was off. I do see some questions about what kind of GCPs we recommend, and uh, yep. and that's uh, Ira just answered that. Okay. Um, Let's see here. Oh yeah, it's a uh, GCPs and base stations. Uh, it's, do you have a rule of thumb if this were in a remote area without access to public base stations, uh, mm -hmm. is to spread those out um, over? I I think ideally in these types of uh, acquisitions, um, having your data being collected no more than uh, 10 kilometers from a base station would be my okay. recommendation. Right. Um, I right. see there's obviously not a distinct line between good and bad. It's a slowly uh, devolving situation, but 10 kilometers seems to be uh, acceptable for most of these trajectory post processings. But ideally, closer. The uh, uh, there's another question as far as is in one flight, uh, how much you can cover it. It's um, it's relative to of course the aircraft, but uh, the max we've seen with uh, a manned helicopter, even with a uh, let's just say uh, an R44. I don't I don't even know what would be the the max flight time. Have you seen four hours in in one? Corridor seen, mapping flight? It has seen close to four hours, yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, they're cool. typically traveling at about uh, 50 knots, I think, about 28 meters per second. Um, and uh, uh, so I guess if we do the calculation from there, you can get uh, an idea of distance. It really typically depends on the size of your bladder. So yes. uh, at that point, may, I think it would be a human limitation. Uh, yeah, more than a yep, data absolutely. But uh, but then yeah, it really uh, with with the UAV that's also a difficult question because it depends on regulation and uh, uh, the model of, of UAV that that you're you're flying. But 
Uh, typically, we're flying within a uh, line of sight. And um, I didn't, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I might have missed the overlap section, Ira, but as far as, as your overlap, um, the general rule of thumb was uh, about 60%, uh, especially if you're deriving a, an ortho. Yes, your or overlap is going to be directly related to the, uh, the imagery footprint and if you need an ortho mosaic or not. Um, yeah, an ortho exactly. mosaic needs, I'd say, 50 to 60% uh, overlap, front and side lap, uh, whereas if you are just colorizing your LIDAR, then you can use the flight planner to make sure that your imagery covers the tops of towers as well as the, uh, the ground itself at the proper GSD. Um, but otherwise, uh, basically imagery is going to be your, your constraint there. Right. And I, the, the one thing to note about the, the sensors that we have now, so there is, uh, with the exception of the, the Ranger XL, but the, 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 the Ranger sensors that we have are all 360 and they're much more forgiving uh, based on aircraft roll um, and that FOV calculation. Now with the Ranger XL, you are getting uh, close to double the range that you would with the uh, um, the uh, the Ranger uh, Bucks based systems, and uh, with that, uh, your your forgiveness is more in your altitude. You can fly much higher, and uh, and if you have roll, you could still uh, account for that based sheer on on swath width. Um, so uh, as far as is kind of a manned corridor buster it would be your your ranger xl based on shear of 1.5 megahertz 1.5 million points per second and and uh and power so you have much much higher range um it is a 75 degree field of view so uh, it doesn't have that 360 field of view that that the ranger has so if, if you are scanning more oblique um, you're going to miss those those features, uh, but uh, uh, when it comes to just Nader type corridor mapping, uh, the the Ranger XL is, is by far the um, you know the the I guess the the latest and greatest on that. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, is there anything else, Lido, that uh, we're missing here? Okay, so oh. we got what Brent said, uh, 3, 3 to 3.5 on the EC120. So, um, and let's see here. Any other ones? I did see a question about uh, how long to, um, I think it refers to calibration with long corridors. Uh, how often should we fly a circle for mapping in the long street corridor in order to keep the, nav the navigation system happy? That isn't so much of an issue with ours, especially with the dual antenna systems, correct? It depends on your IMU, so it's uh, it's really uh, your 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 heading error um, is uh, is key. So if you fly a straight line for a long time, uh, I think the max that you can get away with a baseline on some of these helicopters depends if if the the, the antennas are one is mounted on the tail, one up front um, to get a decent baseline, but but still. I, I don't know if you have a, a rule of thumb, even with uh, the higher um, navigation grade IMUs. No, I don't. Um, yeah, yeah heading uh, drift is certainly something to be cognizant of. Um, yeah. If you are seeing yourself flying 20 miles in a straight line, um, probably throw a, a curve in there or two. Uh, do one of these clover leaf turns as we saw before and break up your straight line into maybe three individual um, straight lines front to back. Um, that will certainly make your navigation system happier, um, but I don't have a, a cold number in terms of mileage before heading drift becomes an issue, but um, something to think about while you're planning your acquisition. So one good question I also had earlier is, is that, um, <laughs> I, and yes, people have heard that when you fly some of these sensors, you have to fly scary close, which you said 20 to, to 30 meters, um, and how to fly it. Yes, some of these sensors do. Uh, it's 
it's usually the conductors that are jacketed. Um, uh, these, uh, these jacketed conductors usually with this e EPDM type materials, 5% uh, reflective. And uh, that insulated jacket with uh, the you know, 905 lower powered 905 nanometer uh, sensors, your max range uh, from the sensor to the target is, is right around 30 to 35 meters. So you have to just to, to catch that that jacketed conductor, you have to be within that range. Those are typically for um, the a lot of the automotive. So the there's the um, the Velodynes, the uh, VLP16, and and the HDL32 to be within that range. But there are also the longer range 905 nanometers, like the Scout Ultra, um, which you will pick that up at at about 80. 80 meters range. Now with the, the, the higher power 1550, uh, you can pick that up and uh, it depends on your pulse repetition rate, but even at 820 kilohertz, uh, uh, I don't know if, if I've tested that, uh, if you've seen on jacketed conductors, because usually they're bare conductors on these, these larger transmission mm -hmm. lines. It really, the jacketed is going to be your uh, urban environment where there's, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, trees and, and other objects nearby. Um, but it's, I'm, I think you've seen, easily seen it 150 meter range at oh, 820, easily. even the fastest speed, it pick mm -hmm. up those, those conductors. Um, yeah, I so saw that. it's, it's, it's not a, a 20 to 30 uh, uh, scary close that you guys have heard is, is particularly for, um, you know, the uh, different select sensors. And uh, that wouldn't be recommended, of course, for a manned helicopter. They are for a UAV. And yes, the, the, the flight planning with that is very, very tricky. Um, possible, but just uh, it's recommended you, you use, a, a, typically we call it a scout, use a, a Mavic or something to, uh, to scout the route on some of this. Um, and I know in some of your regions, you are flying beyond visual line of sight. That's um, really depends on the, the, the country regulations. It's um, here, it's in the States, it's typically within line of sight. Um, so, oh boy, they keep coming. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Alejandro was mentioning that, that uh, uh, they've also seen the Velodyne with um, flat, you know, that insulated jacket, plastic jacketing, uh, struggling to hit that. So just be careful, those, the shield wires, those dark wires, you know, with, with some of these sensors, you, you have to bear that in, in mind, uh, your range to that, that sensor. Um, but with the higher power lasers, you've got more peace of mind that you're not so close. Um, more flexibility. Um, so Jared had a question. Do you recommend following the, the scan rate Spatial Explorer recommends? Um, based on the, the angular step, we noticed it sometimes recommends uh, very low lines per second, something like 40 to 60 lines per second. And what have, have you seen using uh, different calculators? That does seem like a very low lines per second to me as well. Mm. Um, but, For 50 knots, yeah. But that's the, that's the consideration is that there are so many different variables all playing into the, um, to ensuring you're getting the data quality that you need. Um, that AGL speed, um, the power, the lines per second, all of that uh, factors in to each other. And so uh, my recommendation yeah, for that is to just keep playing with the flight planner and um, even a variety of flight planners just to understand how, uh, how those variables interact with each other. Right. And if you have a, the Ranger Mini, uh, well, I don't know if, well, it's, it's the, the Ranger or the, the Ranger XL. There's, there's um, uh, Spatial Explorer, there's Flight Planner, and uh, there's also, um, Right parameter that uh, mm -hmm. that can be used to verify 
uh, across the board. Uh, as far as the flight planner, um, you could assume that the values that we've entered into flight planner are 20% reflectivity. I don't know if for most of you if that's considered conservative or not, but uh, um, those are the, the curves that, that we use for um, the majority of sensors is, is uh, 20% reflectivity or, or natural targets. So uh, the EPDM materials that, that, you know, that are typically five to 8% reflectivity, you want to, to lower that range. But if you have a bare conductor, it's much higher reflectivity than, than 20%. Um, so bear that in mind when planning your, your AGL. Um, and uh, off you, let's see. But uh, yeah, I think that uh, for the most part, Lito, that wraps it up unless you see any other um, questions. Um, I appreciate all the questions rolling in. Um, we do, um, we do, yeah, there's a, there's a veto question and I'll, I'll answer Alejandro on that, but Ira, thank you for, for your time. Um, Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to, to reach out to info uh, at phoenixlinar.com and uh, um, we'd be more than happy to answer any questions you guys have on um, uh, the right fit for the, the application for, for power lines or for the, um, the vehicle that you have in mind. Um, but uh, um, yeah, we'll leave it. Thank you very much, Ira. And uh, for the rest of you guys, have a, a wonderful day. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.